their 30s say, oh, I don't want to live past 95, but when they're 95, they actually want to live to 96. You know, I want to live, I think, the same reason that I believe everyone else does. Uh, people say, oh, well, death gives meaning to life because it makes life short, and therefore it gives meaning to time. Actually, what gives meaning to life is the things we can do with it. Being creative, creating music, art, poetry, having relationships with other people, being loving. We all like to live indefinitely. In fact, research shows that people don't want to take their lives or end their lives unless they're suffering physical or emotional pain. And people think, oh, well, I don't want to live hundreds of years because they think of themselves living as what we today think of as a hundred-year-old living for a few hundred more years, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about being able to overcome disease and aging, and aging really is a disease-like process. That's going to be a very profound transformation over the next 10, 15 years. Health and medicine has become an information technology. Health and medicine didn't used to be an information technology. The Genome Project gave us the software of life, and biology is a, an information process, and we're now actually able to reprogram this outdated software. We're already smarter than we used to be because of the technology we carry around on, on our belts, but it's gonna go inside our bodies and brains, keeping us healthy, making us smarter. Uh, we're gonna be more creative, better able to express loving sentiments. I mean, that's what I think the future holds more recently the 1990s, where what we, what's happening is we're rectangularizing the mortality curve. Um, and what we're hoping to do as a field uh, that I'm here to represent is to square that curve, but also to push it out to the right as much as possible. But the first thing we want to do is to square it. So the ideal world is that people can live into their 90s uh, and beyond, uh, but the week before they die, they can be playing tennis and uh, hanging out with their great grandkids having a great life, being productive. They don't have to be employed to be productive, of course. We know that grandparents and great-grandparents can help with looking after kids and that, such a, that kind of thing. But we also have evidence that we'll be able to push the maximum human lifespan out as well. Now, there are detractors. There are people that calculate that that's a boundary that we just can't get past. But that would be like saying that the Wright brothers were going to fail because we've never fly, flown before. And I, I want to tell you today that there's lots of reasons for thinking not only will we square that curve, but we will go far beyond that. And you've probably heard that the first person to live to 150 has been al is already born. I think the, the Prime Minister here quoted me on that. Uh, I still truly believe that. Uh, and the technology is going incredibly quickly. And a lot of it I'm sure you're not even aware of. So what we're talking about today, well, I'll tell you about, are technologies that will do the, the bottom part, which is not only make us live as long as we currently do or beyond, but make those years productive and healthy. And I've never met a person yet that if they are healthy and happy, that they don't want to live another day. Typically, those people want to live another 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and also, I was once asked, well, why would you want to live beyond 150? And I said, well, when you're 150 and you're still playing tennis, you're not going to say, OK, I'm happy to die tomorrow. There's just no way, uh, unless you're crazy. Um, what about a thousand years? Well, that's only 20 times what I've already lived, and that went by within a blink of an eye. You know, I don't know if we'll li live to a thousand, but we could live in a world where people are very productive up until the last moment. Then again, if I told you 200 years ago that people would be you know, still playing golf in their 90s, you also would have laughed. But when you calorie restrict animals and even little organisms like worms and yeast cells, they live longer. This is the most universal way to extend lifespan on life on Earth. And this is a study that was done at the University of Wisconsin and is now being continued by one of my former postdocs that I trained uh, a few years ago. And what this shows is that these monkeys live longer uh, and they are healthier. And in fact, I should say it the other way around. They're healthier and therefore they live longer. You can never separate the two, actually. In fact, I, I don't know how to make an animal live longer in a sick state. The only reason they live longer is they're not getting cancer and heart disease and these other diseases. And so there's a number of molecules that are now known to mimic caloric restriction by activating these defenses. And they're in top journals. You know, Nature is the top journal in the world. Um, we published the resveratrol story, as Pamela mentioned. Uh, there's a molecule called rapamycin, which is a drug 
um, that affects the immune system. And metformin is really interesting. Metformin, you can be prescribed by your doctor for diabetes. And if you go to Thailand, you can buy it at a, at a chemist over the counter. And that, at least based on retrospective studies of humans, uh, people who are on metformin tend to live healthier and even potentially longer, even though they started out with high blood sugar and diabetes compared to the rest of us. Uh, I think the world that our children are going to live in and their grandchildren for generations beyond are going to live in a very different world where people, they don't have to worry about getting cancer in their 60s and 70s. And they don't have to worry about becoming frail in their 80s and 90s. And when they reach that point, they'll wonder why we didn't work on this sooner. Thank you for having me. So this is going to put things into perspective. So here's a field mouse. This guy is living out in your backyard, and his lifespan is about six to eight months. He gets a little slower, and he gets eaten, OK? If you take that same mouse, and you put him in a cage, and you take away predation, this mouse will double its lifespan. Same mouse just gets anything he wants to eat and doesn't have to worry about anyone eating him. If you take that mouse and you put him on calorie restriction, you limit the amount of calories he eats to only exactly what he needs and you exercise him, you can, again, double his lifespan. And as a matter of fact, the mouse on the left is the same age as the mouse on the right. He's just had everything optimized, OK? Enter gene therapy. We change one gene, one gene in the mouse. And as a matter of fact, this is FGF21. This is a gene that humans have. You double that lifespan without changing any of the diet or exercise. <laughs> That's pretty powerful. That's one gene. That's one change. That's a gene that you have, that I have, that mouse has. I think that actually, step two that I called a step a moment ago isn't a step at all. That, in fact, the people who are young enough to benefit from these first therapies that give this moderate amount of life extension, even though those people are already middle-aged when the therapies arrive, will be at some sort of cusp they will mostly survive long enough to receive improved treatments that will give them a further 30 or maybe 50 years. In other words, they will be staying ahead of the game. They will be, the therapies will be improving faster than the remaining imperfections in the therapies are catching up with us. This is a very important point for me to get across because you know, most people, when they hear that I predict that, people are, that a lot of people alive today are going to live to, f to a thousand or more, they think that I'm saying that we're going to invent therapies in the next few decades that are so thoroughly uh, eliminating aging that those therapies will let us live to a thousand or more. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that the rate of improvement of those therapies will be enough. They'll never be perfect, but we'll be able to fix the things that 200-year-olds die of before we have any 200-year-olds, and the same for 3 and 400 and so on. I've um, decided to um, give this a little name, which is longevity escape velocity. <laughs> and it, um, <laughs> Well, it, it, seems, it, it seems to get the point across. Uh, so these trajectories here are basically how we would expect people to, to live in terms of remaining life expectancy as measured by their health if, uh, for given ages that they were at the time that these therapies arrived. If you're already 100 or even if you're 80 and an average 80-year-old, we probably can't do a lot for you with these therapies because you're too close to death's door for the really initial initial experimental therapies to be good enough for you. You won't be able to withstand them. But if you're only 50, then there's a chance that you might be able to pull out of the dive and, you know, <laughs> eventually, eventually get, through, um, get through this and, and, and start becoming biologically younger in a meaningful sense, in terms of your youthfulness, both physical and mental, and in terms of your risk of death from age-related causes. And of course, if you're a bit younger than that, then you're not gonna, never any, even going to get near to being fragile enough to die of age-related causes. So this is a genuine conclusion that I come to. Since you've been talking about aging and trying to defeat it, why is it that you make yourself appear like an old man? Because I, <laughs> because I am an old man. I am actually 158. I am sure. I... <laughs> We're replacing many of the ways that we interact with cancer and, and diseases in. in uh, developed nations especially, uh, where 90% of us will die of age-related age diseases, um, is by focusing on the consequences of aging rather than the causes. 
And, uh, and, but there's a growing number of ways that have been demonstrated, usually in fairly simple model organisms like worms and flies, um, but now are making their way up into uh, mouse and, and higher organisms for reversing aging, not just extending longevity. So that some of these live um, two to 10 times longer than their, than their litter mates or their, uh, their uh, siblings. And uh, you can look through the, the world and find organisms that live uh, very long times, 405 years for uh, this clam and, uh, and over 200 years for the bowhead whale. And we've sequenced some of these extreme ones. And even within a species, you'll have extreme ones. Like there's, uh, here's four super centenarians that live over 110 years. And the take home here uh, in brief is not that you have to drink and eat and smoke to excess but that, uh, that there might be something interesting about them. But our goal is not to be really, really old for a long time. It's to reverse aging. That's the goal. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys this afternoon. So I'm going to tell you about uh, primarily the health nucleus uh, at Human Longevity. Uh, and that started off um, as a phenotyping center but in part due to these statistics you can see here changed quite rapidly into a discovery center. So uh, a, a third of you that leave to age 50 will not make it to age 74 or 75. And you can see on this slide the basic reasons for that. 40% um, of men uh, that make it to 50 will not live to age 74. Two thirds of the reasons are cardiovascular disease and cancer. Same for uh, women, only it's more like 24%. And so we thought that just simply by uh, doing early uh, discovery, early diagnostics, or early predictions about these dise two diseases, we could have a big impact on longevity uh, alone. Uh, this early discovery and early diagnostics that we've started making uh, help change where we are in this reactive system of you get symptoms uh, and you go see somebody about those symptoms to a situation where it's proactive, uh, preventative, highly personalized with the genome. Uh, and the genome is going to make it more and more predictive as our database uh, grows. A 75-year-old uh, uh, client that uh, had no elevated PSA, no symptoms, uh, and was very surprised to find that he had a, a very high-grade uh, tumor. Uh, but doesn't just work with uh, prostate cancer. Uh, here's an individual that had uh, multiple uh, lymphoma uh, tumors. Um, here's another one. Uh, it was actually uh, one of our colleagues. It was a fist-sized tumor uh, found in his lungs, and you can just see how brightly uh, it lights up. All of these have been uh, successfully treated, either in this case with radiation uh, and uh, chemotherapy. Uh, everybody that's been diagnosed, the diagnosis have been 100% accurate so far. Uh, no false positives and no false negatives uh, that we know of. Uh, and the percentage that we're seeing is 2.5% of people that come through have a tumor uh, that they don't know about. Our goal is to combine all these findings, and these were unexpected findings. We thought. Uh, we were just going to have a healthy cohort because everybody that comes to the health nucleus is self-defined healthy. But it turns out the definition of health is pretty limited. It means you don't have any symptoms and you look okay and you feel okay. So we can actually tell you whether you're healthy. Uh, it turns out you can't tell us you're healthy. Uh, and we're finding things overall in about 40% of the healthy uh, clients that come to see us, or presumed healthy clients. And we're trying to combine all the symptomology, all of the things we can measure with the genome, uh, with machine uh, learning. I think there's only one way to describe 
the current situation we find ourselves in as it relates to stem cells. And that is to say we have reached a critical point in the history of stem cells, a point that can only be described as this. What you see is a massive number of different stem cell treatments out there. And really, the only thing between them and us are regulatory agencies, such as the FDA in the US. But the number of stem cell treatments out there are getting so overwhelming that some are just falling through the cracks. And the question then is, how did we get here? And what does that mean to you? Over the course of a year, we met Neil in Panama and at the Reardon Clinic in Wichita, Kansas, to find out as much as we can about the benefits of stem cell therapy. Tell me where you get the stem cells from that you use in these procedures. The umbilical cord's cut, baby's taken away, and then some short time thereafter, mother delivers the afterbirth, which includes the placenta and the umbilical cord and the amnion, and all of that tissue is rich in, in, in cells, and these cells are they're basically biologic garbage and they're, they're, they're thrown away. So what we do is we take that tissue, you've reset the clock, these are day zero cells from a baby that was just born. They have a high degree of ability to reproduce and to secrete the things, the three major things that we know that they do in the body. They secrete a, a batch of molecules that stimulate regeneration, that decrease inflammation and modulate the immune system. So their main body their main job in the body is to maintain the status quo. So when you're sick, you're not maintaining the status quo. When you're 70, you're not maintaining the status quo. Look at yourself, look at a picture of you 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You haven't maintained the status quo, things are going south. And so these cells, their job is to maintain the status quo and that's why I think they're so important for, for aging research and for chronic illness. What stem cells do can seem little short of miraculous. What I do myself and what, what I think is going to be ultimately the answer for a lot of age-related decline and age-related chronic diseases is taking young healthy stem cells, for example from umbilical cord, and using those to supplement what you have. Because not only do they they do the job of the stem cells that you used to have, but they also stimulate what you have left to behave younger. So they are the reason you renew yourself. And you know, one question I get quite often is, how can these stem cells treat so many conditions? And the simple answer to that is the root cause of most of those conditions is lack of stem cells. Either lack of stem cells or the ones you have left aren't working properly. So if the common cause is that, then it would make sense that, it, that the, the treatment of choice would be replacement of those stem cells with ones that are healthy and ones that are, are active. We make strides every year on manufacturing costs and you know, technological breakthroughs that allow us to grow, grow many more cells at, at, at a lot lower cost. That it's, and, and then, you know, of course, the more people that do it, the smaller the margins have to be. But to specifically answer your question, I think our VIP, you know, superstar, super wealthy population is, is, is less than 5% of, you know, our, our patient population. And just a final one, no ethical or moral questions because no. I think people still remember the early days of stem cells when they were taken from fetuses and things like that. Yeah, well you're talking about embryonic stem cells, which is, and, and I've talked to a lot of doctors about this, I've become quite versed in it. And um, uh, embryonic stem cells have nothing but strange anomalies and like where you grow teeth on your shoulder and so, I mean it's very weird. And, uh, but they actually don't work and they produce a freak show, whereas adult stem cells and technically uh, mesenchymal stem cells from an umbilical cord are adult stem cells and morally there's no um, stigma or there's not even a debate because the kid's off somewhere sucking a rattle, he's fine, you know, so it's like, you know, um, you know, it's all good. The concept of using animal organ for human transplant has been attempted for decades. 
However, there are two technical hurdles prevent the use of that in the clinical setting. For the first one, as you can imagine, there is a problem of rejection. And for the second one, there are endogenous retrovirus can pass from the pig to the human because there is no solution to address those two problems. The field has almost been silent for the last 20 years. And that is where we think we can make a difference. To pursue my love of nature, I studied biology and psychology in Beijing University. And I feel very lucky to be part of my generation that witnessed the transformation of the society that instilled in me a lot of confidence and aspiration to make a difference. To continue my love in science, I came to the United States for my PhD at Harvard. Working with Dr. George Church, in 2013, we were one of the first two groups that reported the use of CRISPR-Cas, the gene editing tool in the mammalian system. Using the tool, in 2015, we demonstrate that we can eradicate all the 62 copies of the virus from the pig genome. By doing so, we broke the record for a number of modifications we can done at the same time in one mammalian system, a record we still hold today. The second one in place is five modification. More importantly, we demonstrate we can eliminate the viral transmission and make people reassess the clinical reality of using animal organ for human transplant. With that, we launched the company eGenesis and successfully closed our Series A of $38 million with Arch Venture Biomedics and OTA partner. After hundreds of trials, this year, we successfully produced the first generation of the pig don't have any endogenous retrovirus. You probably have seen their picture in the front page of New York Times this summer. And we named the first pig Laika, the name of a Soviet dog who was the first animal sent to orbit the Earth. We actually have the printer right here. So um, in, while we've been talking today, we've actually, uh, uh, you can actually see the printer back here in, in the backstage, that's actually the actual printer right now, and that's been printing this uh, kidney structure that you see here. Uh, it takes about seven hours to print the kidneys, so this is about three hours into it now. And Dr. Kang's gonna walk on stage right now, and we're actually gonna show you one of these kidneys uh, that we printed a little bit earlier today. Put a pair of gloves here. So these gloves are a little bit small on me, but here it is. You can actually see that kidney as it was printed earlier today. You know, we now have a long history of doing this. I'm going to share with you a clip in terms of uh, technology that we have had in patients now for a while. And this is actually a very brief clip, only about 30 seconds of a patient who actually received an organ. I was really sick. I, I could barely get out of bed. I was missing school. It was just pretty much miserable. I couldn't, you know, go out and play, you know, basketball at recess without feeling like I was going to pass out when I got back inside. It was, I felt so sick. I was facing basically a lifetime of dialysis and I don't even like to think about what my life would be like if I was on that. So after the surgery, um, life got a lot better for me. I was able to do more things. I was able to wrestle in high school. I became the captain of the team and that was great. I was able to be, you know, the normal kid with my friends and because they use my own cells to, you know, build this bladder, it's going to be with me. I got it for life, so I'm all set. Americans eat 100 million pigs uh, a year. So even if, every, if we had everybody with end-stage heart disease get a xeno heart, it would be only 1 million pigs out of 100 million. Still plenty of bacon left for everybody. Plenty of pigs to go around. <laughs> and then finally, um, the ultimate stage is we are 3D printing uh, the scaffold for an uh, organ and then cellularizing that scaffold with inducible pluripotent stem cells, that's a fancy word for saying your own cells that have been taken out from apheresis from your own bloodstream, 
and modified to be either the cardiac cell or the type of cells that would be needed for a liver or a kidney to recellerize this scaffold that has been 3D printed of collagen. Collagen, by the way, is throughout our bodies. Um, oftentimes, the more the merrier. And, uh, and then have an unlimited supply of per transplantable organs, the DNA of which is a custom fit to you because it's your same DNA. That'll be available by the 2030s, and the xenotransplantation option will be available by the 2020s. Are you sitting tight? I'm about to give you one hell of a ride. <laughs> First of all, I will give you all no eyes. We will certainly prove that all the experts know is wrong and show that transplanting a head onto a new body is feasible in man. No less. Many years ago, a young doctor lost one of his best friends to cancer. But this was no ordinary doctor. He was a brilliant American neurosurgeon who believed that perhaps had he been able to transplant the healthy head of his friend, escaped by the cancer on a healthy donor body, he would have saved his life. In 1970, Dr. White carried out the first head-body transplantation of monkeys. But the problem was that at the time, he did not have the technology to rejoin a severed spinal cord. And so left the animal paralyzed. Over the past 35 years, researchers from all around the world set out to find a cure for spinal paralysis. Despite high hopes and many promising leads, they all failed. Thus, in the expert's opinion, reconstructing the spinal cord is impossible. And so, is head transplantation. But something has happened. There's a new kid in town, Gemini. I give you the spinal cord fusion protocol, and your lives won't be again the same. I think from a scientific view, the human body is a, it's a complex molecular machine, and aging and disease and death are molecular phenomena that can be fixed, just as when a car gets old, you can fix it. You can replace the parts that are broken. You can repair the parts that you don't want to replace. And I think we're now at the point where we can scientifically confront the problem of ending aging and disease. It's a hard problem, but it's not an impossible problem. And artificial intelligence software, along with nanotechnology and many other advanced technologies, Synthetic biology, for example, can be, can be used to address this problem. So I, I'm reasonably confident that my kids, who are in their 20s, are not going to have to die. I'm 49 years old, and I'm, 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 I'm hoping I can make it, right? Because I, I think we're decades away from beating death, not, not centuries away. And the other thing that's amazing is that's not going to be the most exciting technology advance because preserving human bodies beyond their biologically ordained lifespan is not even going to seem like the most interesting thing we can do. We're going to be able to build new bodies using molecular nanotechnology and pour our minds into, into different bodies and into compute clouds and so forth. So I, I think the, the array of possibilities that technology is going to unfold for us within the next decades is something that that anyone without a head full of science fiction is going to be completely amazed and bedazzled by. I'm trying to make uh, Eric's visions 
a practical reality. Since then, there have been a number of theoretical advances and experimental advances leading toward the working out of that technology in a practical sense. And the ultimate goal of that is to build nanofactories and ultimately medical nanorobots so that we can all have very long extended lives. I have a message for my fellow baby boomers. Aging is a disease. It's a curable disease. Nanomedicine is the cure for that disease. We have the resources and the brain power to develop nanomedicine. All we lack is the will to act. We expect that by 2045, we will reach the technological singularity, which is the time when artificial intelligence reaches human intelligence. And that will be the end of the human age that we know. So I hope that you do not sleep tonight. The end of the human age. But so that you sleep tomorrow, it will be the beginning of the post-human age, of immortal humans, of incredibly intelligent humans, of incredibly interconnected humans. So uh, we expect that, again, at the latest, by 2045, we will actually become immortal. As you can see the subtitle, 2045, the year man becomes immortal. And for ladies here also, do not worry, ladies will also become immortal. 30 years ago, personal computers were just beginning. When I typed my first thesis at MIT, I used a primitive technology called typewriter. Have you seen typewriters? I used that primitive technology, a caca technology, 30 years ago at MIT. 20 years ago, mobile phones were beginning. 10 years ago, companies like Google, Facebook um, were starting and changing the world. So what is going to happen in the next 20, tw uh, 30, 40 years in the future? We are going to see magic, real magic. One of those things is we are going to cure all diseases. We are going to be able to have immortal, ageless cells. Because we say that aging is a disease, but it is a curable disease. And we expect that aging will be cured in the next two to three decades. If we look at sort of what, what the important developments that might happen in the future are, probably the one that's going to be sort of the biggest discontinuity in human history is when human immortality is achieved, which it undoubtedly will be. How will it be achieved? There are two basic paths. It's either you know, technology and electronics and so on, or it's biology. Which one will win and how fast, I don't know. Probably neither will happen in my generation, which is a shame. But um, uh, the, you know, the, the thing that um, uh, is, uh, you know, from a technological point of view, it's when do we get to emulate all that human-like stuff in a pure piece of technology that can, be, you know, can have complete longevity. Uh, from a biological point of view, how do we patch the system we have uh, to keep it going as long as possible. A virtual persona is that there are an infinite number of frontiers. In fact, I can work eventually with my AI, my artificial intelligence, and create a world that is of the dream I want to live in and go and live in that world. And I can be the, the king you know, of my own world and invite people to come in and be part of that. And I can invite you to come and play in my world. And we're going to have an infinite number of realities we can start to, to explore. Clearly. Um, other benefits include our ability to become a space-faring species where the physical limitations of, uh, of accelerating things to the speed of light uh, or of uh, really needing to you know, remain alive for longer than the normal human lifespan uh, will, will change and we become liberated for our ability to go and, and populate this galaxy and this universe and the what may be an infinite number of universes. And ultimately, it's the ability to, um, to become far more, you know, the term is dangerous to say, but godlike, where we have life everlasting, uh, where we have um, uh, meaning that we don't have to die a physical death, uh, that we are who we are, our mission, our purpose, our consciousness can continue for a longer period of time. And when we become, as, when we become conscious as a meta-intelligence ourselves, will we look out into the universe and see 
thousands or millions or billions of similar conscious planet-level uh, existences that have, that have come into being. I mean, it's you know, literally insane to think about these things. There are a crazy, infinite number of options. But it's happening during our lifetimes, and that's what makes it so extraordinary and so exciting to be alive right now. But let me go on. One of our other donors, again, is completely anonymous. He hasn't, hasn't even uh, asked us for a tax receipt, so we really don't know who he is, he or she. Uh, but the last donor is one that you may already have heard about, because that last donor, who has given us now $2 million, is... Um, you know, there's been quite a lot written about this, this person, this probably guy, I don't know. Um, he's again kept himself anonymous, but he ended up with something north of $100 million in the bank as a result of the surge in Bitcoin. And he decided to give most of it away, not all to one place, but in large chunks. Most of the people he's given it to have been um, getting order of a million. We've got two million. We're actually one of only three charities that have received more than a million from this person. Now, he's decided to do it in an interesting public way. He announced this initiative on Reddit. I mean, what? You know, I mean, this again indicates that he's probably one of the children of the revolution, right? Um, and he, you know, he said, I'm going to give this money away. Please write to me if you have a case for receiving some of this money. Um, and you know, one or two people wrote to him, as you might imagine. He's had a little bit of work to do, keeping his inbox under control. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, he's given probably half of it away by now, I think, something like that. And, um, and the rest is coming over the next few weeks. It's like, and this guy decided that he wanted to support a lot of medical stuff, also a lot of uh, infrastructure stuff, a lot of the stuff he supported in the third world. But it took us literally an hour to persuade him to give us a million dollars. And he came back a couple of... Um, weeks later and say you'd like to give us another million. So that's like, you know, I mean, like, it makes me cry, honestly. I, 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 I've been working so hard doing all of this uh, for so long, and it's just like, here we are. Um, One controversy that comes up is that people say, well, it's fine to fix problems. Bill McKibben said this. Uh, disease, disabilities, uh, it's fine to, to overcome these kinds of limitations, but we shouldn't go beyond normal human capabilities. Not that that's a sharply defined limit, but what, what's your view about that particular controversy? We need to always go beyond normal human capabilities because that's our nature as human beings. Human beings are the species that transcend their limitations. It's wonderful that we do, because thanks to those transcendence of our limitations, we now have beautiful music, amazing art, we're able to travel the globe, we're able to relieve pain and suffering for millions of people. One more limitation is the unfortunate loss of all of an individual's knowledge and goodness with the degradation of their body. If there was no other way to avoid it, we'd have to accept it. And that's what all of religion has, has been about for the past several millennium, is teaching us to accept that. Thanks to science and technology, we're now at the cusp of transcending that limitation. And it's nothing to be fearful for. It's something we should grab for with both arms and uh, welcome the transcendence of this last human limitation, the limitation of illness, disability, and death. Now, one argument I hear is people say death is a good thing because it frees up opportunities for the younger generation to provide leadership and creativity. And Bill McKibben said, you know, if Mozart was still alive today, he'd be in charge of the conservatories and would keep out new ideas and music. One of the, one of the most important reasons for us to transcend death is because of the, is because of the beauty that we can share with grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and, and further down the line. There is a, a love between grandparents and grandchildren that cannot be matched. And unfortunately, we begin to lose this with great-grandchildren and great-grandchildren because we don't live long enough. There are so many things that we can teach those children that they can teach us. Intergenerational love is one of the most beautiful forms of love. And by transcending death, we will, we will empower an explosion of intergenerational love. 
I like trying to pursue the three bridges of radical life extension, which are first of all to use supplementation to try to reprogram um, aspects of my body which are degrading, and then secondly to do all that I can to pave the way forward for biotechnology and nanotechnology to extend our lives yet further, and then finally to pursue full mind uploading to ensure that we have um, freedom from whatever um, the happenstance may occur to a single body. I think it's really important to get to the point of one mind, multiple bodies as, as rapidly as possible. Coming through the door 